Hi, we're here today at IE Gallery in Edison, Washington. And we're looking at the work of Jeff Gunn, Pacific Northwest artist, painter, and he's with her, us here today to talk about his work. And the, this particular exhibit is called Stone and Light. So hi, Jeff, how are you today? I'm doing fine so far. Good. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and start um, telling us about your work? Well, the first thing I thought I'd talk about is how, um, just mentioned that last year at this time I had a show in Portland and I found out, I saw that it was all about water and the fluidity of water. And I saw that that was even true in the, in the desert paintings that are about water because there's very little water in the desert. And this year I discovered that it was all about stone and then I started thinking about stone and rock. Mm -hmm. I saw how I've got sketchbooks going way back. I meant to bring them today actually. Uh, full of stone and rock. I want to tell a little teeny story about how I discovered something about rock. Great. Um, one night in, when I lived in Seattle in the 80s, I, I came upon a Scot in a, in a tavern. And in my family, nobody, nobody um, would not take an advantage to speak with a Scot for a while. Everything's good is Scottish. Everything Scottish is good. That's not really true. But, um, but I, we got to talking and we tried Guinness in a number of taverns so we ended up at Murphy's Pub where I could run a tab. And in the middle of all that, he said something astounding. He says, what is that about stone? <laughs> and I said, well, stone is heavy. It's dense. It doesn't move. It's constant. It's eternal. And he said, nah, the fluidity. sort of stuff me still for a good long while and so when I'm painting stone or drawing stone I'm seeing how fluid stone is and especially like stone and water that's a great segue into this one uh -huh. um, stone and water form each other <clears throat> and so this painting started this is over an old painting some of which is still showing through and I began the painting without any plan at all. I just mixed a color and put it on there and then mixed another color and put it next to it and mixed another color and put it next to that and kept changing that until it started to form in my mind, it started to feel like the area of the, um, of the Puget Sound and the, all the regions of the, you know, the. San Juan Islands and mm -hmm. going up into BC, mm -hmm. right out front, you know, just like from right out from, from the Skagit here. Mm. Um, and so then I, knowing that, it started to take that, the forms of islands and water. Mm. And so I ended up with the title, Near Shores and Far Shores. And then you have the indigenous peoples who lived here uh, as part of kind of, it's on the label below. So yeah. it's also the Stillaquamish and the Swinomish and the Skagit. <clears throat> right, and so some years ago, you know, wherever I'm painting, if it's a specific place, I'm more and more conscious of the places that, that were inhabited by peoples way before white people showed up. Beautiful. So I simply want to acknowledge that. It's not like I know a whole lot about that. I uh -huh. just feel responsible to acknowledge that we're on land that's been known and understood for centuries. Centuries. Exactly. Before we even thought to be here. <clears throat> exactly. And this is all oil, isn't it? This one's all oil. I thought for a while, I thought there was tar or something else in there, but... No, because yeah, and this I is, have yeah. I have done that before. 
Okay. Put a tar in my paintings. It's beautiful. And for the viewers, I think we've got a dimension here of about, um, what does it say on it's the label? It's roughly four by five and a half feet. Okay, so five and a half feet across. Well, all together, it's like four by six. Yeah, four by six, that's almost, what I was thinking. Almost six feet. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And um, the rest of the exhibit, you do have some tar sometimes in your encaustic, and I'll just say this for the viewers, that this exhibit does include oils on canvas, encaustics on panel, and um, three monoprints, and um, a couple of mixed media on paper. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, where should we move to next? Um, well... Do you want to continue with the oils? Let's go with the oils. Yeah. We'll just continue with the oils. Okay. So, um, this one refers to Hoe Head from a based on drawings that I did. Very rough, sketchy drawings. I'm going to have to bring some in. Uh, that I did a camping trip there with my friend Jeffrey Stewart uh, many, many, many years ago in the 90s, I believe it was. Mm. And uh, the standing stones in the water, coming right out of the water, mm. and on the beach is really love that. And I've and I've painted it in the same sort of put a patch here, put mm -hmm. a patch there, mm -hmm. so that it grows organically. It doesn't mm -hmm. grow like I've made a design and filled it in. Mm -hmm. I simply let it grow like a like nature grows. Mm -hmm. Beautiful gestures. You probably use both brush and palette knife here. And pieces of cardboard. Oh yeah, for scraping or whatever. Yeah. Well, no, just lay, that, that was laid in with a piece of cardboard. Oh, okay. You can see the striations in the cardboard. Corrugated cardboard. Oh yeah. <clears throat> I hand that out to students so they won't be fussy. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. You teach um, oils and encaustic and sometimes plein air? I don't teach it encaustic anymore, but oh, okay. I taught it for about 16 years, and that oh. was enough. This is a combination of cardboard and palette knife and brush also. And this is based on sketches that I did around, there's a, there's a trail that goes around Mount Hood, way, or not Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, uh -huh. way up at high elevation. Um, and I was up there camping, and there's this rock called Hesong Rock. I only know that because it, mm. I looked it up on the topo map. Uh, so I did many sketches of this rock and rocks in that area. There's another one down the road, down the aisle here. Mm -hmm. And where did you say the area is of this rock? It's I. Well, you call it Puyallup Is that right? Well, you know, uh, yeah, this is I think Puyallup land. Some of these didn't quite get marked correctly. Yeah. And then we come to Wizard Rock. Yeah. This is Wizard Rock, which is on the Oregon coast, where uh, we visited last, a couple of months ago. The Solettes and Tillamook Clan. It's so, looks like the Oregon coast. Yeah. And the rocks, gosh, I love getting up close and seeing your gestures with the paint. It's really beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's cardboard. Oh, yeah. And this, I'm not sure what the name of this one is, this rock. Um, oh, it's where the water comes through, um, like an arch? It, yeah, like I just call it a cove. A cove, yeah. yeah. So the, the water wears at the rock. How many mm -hmm. millions of years does it take to do that? And is that near Tillamook or where somewhere in the or on the Oregon coast? Yeah, it's on the Oregon coast. Okay. And these dimensions are about 25 inches in height and about 21 inches across. That's including the There's a little bit of variety in the dimensions, but yeah. gorgeous. And this is another one of Petsong Rock. 
Hessong again. Mm -hmm. Okay. From a different sketch. Okay, and that's spelled H E S S O N G. If anybody wants to see where that is located, I love those green strokes across there. the pink across there yeah I just want to say I know I've known your painting since the 80s and boy you sure have a wonderful sense of color and relaxed uh, kind of knowledge of how to use color and not be afraid of color because in the Pacific Northwest we can get a little bit color shy sometimes uh -huh. um, and this is <coughs> really rich yeah Let's go look at that one over there. Okay. But this one... I'll have to, it'll take me a minute to adjust the camera to make sure I can film this because it's against the light. Yeah. But I'll get up close so people can see it. Go yeah. ahead. Tell us about this one. So this one, uh, this is a, not a copy, but an interpretation of a Chinese painter's, uh, a particular Chinese painting that I've loved for years. The painter's name is Hong Ren and he's from the early Qing Dynasty, so the early 1600s. He's a contemporary of Rembrandt. Uh, and I, in the original, it's thin, delicate, precise, crisp, black lines on white paper. It's the exact same size as this, by the way. Mm, those, okay, exactly the size. And yeah. you use the um, composition structure, etc. I, I've done a very loose version of it before, much okay. taller, much larger, and actually not quite the same proportion. But in this one, I wanted to be, get it precise and actually learn from his, his proportioning of things. So I measured it all out. I measured the halfway point, the third points on all sides, and I plotted the thing very carefully and got very confused in a lot of it. Mm -hmm. In the black and white, here's the thing, in the black and white version, the original version, sky and rock and water and a little bit of land in the front are all white paper. Mm -hmm. So I read that as being, it's all mind. It's mm -hmm. all what the Buddhists call bodhicitta. It's all enlightened mind. He was a monk, by the way. He became a monk at the turn of the, Chin, the Qing dynasty, from the Ming dynasty, the Bright dynasty, to the Qing dynasty. And in protest, many, many painters became monks so that they wouldn't be in, forced into service for the, mm -hmm. new, uh, the new empire. So uh, I find his story really fascinating. He's sometimes referred to as the Chinese cubist. Oh, yeah. Because the way his... The way these little forms are so strict mm -hmm. and create tension with each other just thrills me. <clears throat> and it moves in and out of the planes of perspective in some ways, in that yeah. way it carries that, I don't know how you would describe it, but the very Asian feel well, of s flat but not flat. Exactly, and that's what has fascinated me about Asian art for many yeah. years. Many, many years ago in Seattle, a dear friend of mine named Seth Thompson was looking at my work and he said, you're using Chinese space. Oh. This was in the early 90s. Wow. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Yeah. So I started looking up uh, Asian art and now I've been, uh, yeah. I don't know, I'm stuck on Asian art for decades It's now. gorgeous. I love getting these close shots and yeah, and seeing how you do break up the space and then, yeah. It mostly follows his shapes. Yeah. But of course his was in black and white. I made very close, a lot, I took a lot of care, let's say, in, in making sure this is the same value. The it's values. a different color, but exactly. it's the same value. Exactly. Even this is the same value. Let me go down to where you are. Which is the this same? This yellow and, and the, the green blue, water. Or the water, yeah. And that little glow of blue in the middle, I get really excited. That was a yeah. mistake that I'm really excited about. Um, 
That's so cool. But they're the same value. So a black and white of this looks pretty bland. It's, yeah. You know, it makes me think of um, Vuillard. Yeah. And, yeah. and because Vuillard was so excellent at doing that same thing with values, and that's when the French started to look at the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Japanese prints, I believe. That's right. Oh, yeah. that's gorgeous. Yeah. Okay, good. So I got some better. That. I apologize, people, for that backlighting, but when I got up close, we got some good shots. Yeah. So, what should we go to now? Right, go to the encaustics. encaustics yeah. yeah. And you have been working with encaustics since about the 80s, the mid 80s? Uh, when did I start? Yes, mm -hmm. 1985. Mm -hmm. I had gone to the um, Foster White Gallery one day and saw the work of Joseph Goldberg mm. and it changed everything. Mm -hmm. I looked at the tag and it said encaustic. I had no idea what that was. I looked it up in the Ralph Meyer handbook mm -hmm. of, of uh, techniques and found that there was some information on encaustic and based on that I just figured it out mm -hmm. with a lot of failures over time. Anyways, I made up my own ways of doing it. That's mm -hmm. Joe Goldberg had made up his own ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I also use a lot of um, uh, Chinese ink on paper mm -hmm. in my work. And then I collage a lot of that. So this is all Chinese ink on paper. And the paper is this size. It's a Chinese size. Mm -hmm. um, and so this kind of format is typical in a mm -hmm. lot of Asian paintings. Sometimes mm -hmm. they, they roll them together. They might be 27 feet long. They can you just roll it out oh, yeah. a little bit at a time. Um, but sometimes I'll do something like I'll take a piece of, of uh, wood or a piece of concrete and I'll print that with ink on the paper. And then I'm, I deal with that accident. And so that's how this came about, with okay. lots of little tears and holes in it. And then I developed it into something else. Let's take a minute and explain to viewers who aren't familiar with encaustic, which is basically a hot, hot wax, often mm -hmm. beeswax, that's mixed in with the media. But let's, let's explain how you use it. Um, oh, I use it a lot of different ways. Oh, do you? Yeah, you don't there's, like... a, there's a lot of different techniques that I've learned or discovered. So you're here. so you don't but you don't do you use it like Joe Goldberg used to use a blowtorch? I use a blowtorch. Do you too? Okay. Yeah, yeah I use a uh, yeah, that's what I use. So and the, then I use a scraper to scrape it down flat. Okay. And then I use various methods of getting um, color into it. Mm -hmm. And like Joe Goldberg, I'll mix the color in the water to get a, a slurry of color, mm -hmm. and I'll lay that on, and in layers. So underneath this layer, there's these teal layers. Yeah, beautiful, I love seeing that. I'm gonna go up close. Um, and then... This is so rich. And then, I'll melt that in after the, after the pigment dries. And I'll go over it with another layer of wax to separate them, and then I'll put this strange warm gray on top, mm -hmm. and then they interact. But you can you can see one through the other. Mm -hmm. Likewise, down here, I did the whole series of different layers of color mm -hmm. in there. And this is, of course, well, not of course, but it's done flat face up on a, a table or something. Yeah, you can't do it vertical or the, when you melt it. Yeah, it the drip. wax just drips <laughs> off. And it's always, um, it has to be on a rigid surface so it doesn't, doesn't so if these are on panel, that way it won't crack. It has to be on a, on a rigid panel. Yeah, that's so gorgeous. That's so reminiscent of the Pacific Northwest, this piece. It's these islands again. The it's, islands, it's yeah. All these like rocks and islands. It's almost like Hat Island out there where yeah. I went camping a couple of times years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like the San Juans and out by Anacortes. Right. And this, this piece is a little older, isn't it? This is about 10 years old. Okay. I did a series of these, and actually, uh, this is called um, Still in Love with Wind and Dust. Oh. I have a, um, a friend of mine from Taiwan who 
works at the Chinese Garden in Portland. Um, we were talking about something, and she said something like, I forget how it is in Chinese, but she says, in love with wind and dust. It's a saying mm. that she knew from childhood about, like, yeah, trouble comes all the time. So we're just we're just in love with wind and dust. It's oh, always, wow. There's always a bother. Wow. So you change your attitude about it. Wow, that, so, I love that. So I, I did a very loose and free and crazy interpretation of the character for wind and the character for dust. And these are, are, are calligraphy characters? These are calligraphy on paper that were then, and then just some, some strange marks. Actually, I did the calligraphy right on the plaster surface. I usually start with a, with a um, rabbit skin glued gesso uh -huh. plaster surface. Oh, you do? It's very absorbent. Oh, you've got the, the plaster in there. I didn't yeah, realize Yeah, it's that. not plaster like from like plastering walls. Building, uh-huh. It's rabbit skin glue gesso. Oh, okay. And which is basically a kind of a plaster. And these, yeah. these are printed from a doily, a paper doily. That's what I recognized. Yeah. And it just creates a pattern. Uh huh. And like I said, these are very loose, crazy interpretations of mm -hmm. those calligraphies. And is that why the maps are part of this as well? Yeah, I collaged the map in here. This happens to be a nautical map of the area just north of us here, oh. going into the Canadian waters. Oh, cool. But it's upside down. Um, and there it says. Love, love, wind and dust. In love with wind and dust. Oh, my that's calligraphy. wonderful. That's a... Uh, that gives this painting a whole new <laughs> meaning for me now that I look at it. So um, right. here we go. Let's go to the next ones. So gone... Uh, wait a minute. This one's gone to ground. Mm -hmm. This one, so it's labeled backwards a little bit, but um, this one's called That Ridge from This Ridge, and I took an old encaustic that wasn't working, and I took scraps of calligraphy practice, I do a lot of Chinese calligraphy practice, and I tore it in strips and then reassembled it, mm. sort of, it's sort of a Dada kind mm -hmm. of a way of working, but you find new shapes that way, mm -hmm. and it creates, it created a mountain or a ridge. So in some ways, I'm, I'm thinking of the ridges around Hesong Rock and Mount Rainier. Mm. This one at the bottom was spontaneous explorations using that. scraps of different papers. And then when I saw it, it felt like this felt like wind. And this felt very stable. Mm -hmm. Like, I think of... Uh, an explanation of Earth is from mm -hmm. some philosophical systems. It's just a, a yellow square, mm -hmm. just a yellow square, utterly stable. The Earth is stable. Wind is always moving. Mm -hmm. So if if Earth has a rhythm, it's it's steady. It doesn't move. Water has a rhythm of one. It's like a waltz. One, two, three. One, two, three. And fire is also a three point. It jumps. It, it one, two, three, one, two, three. Right? It's mm. going up. Water's always going down. Mm. So I think in these terms all the time when I'm painting. I think in terms of the elemental mm -hmm. uh, aspects of something. So this felt like water over earth. And I noticed that I wrote on the back of it, I'll which I looked that up in the e, if you look up, up in the I Ching. It's, I forget the number of it, but look up wind, wind, wind over earth. earth. Mm -hmm. Moment of transition, reflection, preparation. Yes. Contemplation, view. Oh, there's the, um, um, what do you call that in I Ching? The cone, no, the six lines. The six lines, yeah, the, the hexagram. Lines, the hexagram. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... Not that I'm an expert in that. No, but it's... But I, um, but I think of it often. Uh, this one, intertidal, is simply another 
exploration of the forms of rock, sand, water, mm -hmm. all fluid on any any coastline, mm -hmm. at least on our northwest coastline. Completely. But this one, this one has no particular place. Mm -hmm. And you've got another impression of a pattern here. Of oh, these re repeating patterns? The repeating circles. What yeah, a few years ago I did a lot of paintings where just impressions of nutshells. Oh, that's what it is. Nothing but nutshells over and over and over, I remember and, over those. and over again. Yeah. And some of them, I've been painting over them, and so they create a, a backdrop. A base, yeah. A rhythm. Yeah. Let's see. I'm just getting a close-up of some of these gorgeous overlays of colors. Okay, should we move over to the monoprints that you did up at the Umatilla? Sure. Is that how you pronounce the reservation land? Umatilla? Is yeah, that right? that's right, the Umatilla Reservation in eastern Oregon near Pendleton, mm -hmm. a little past Pendleton. Right, so um, I did these a few years ago also, but they've been in a drawer since. I've not shown them. Mm. And I was, when working with these, I was thinking of a, a trip that I'd taken up in the, what was it called? Spider Meadows up in the, in the Cascades. Or do you, you don't call it the Cascades. I'm not sure what area that is, but it's out by Wenatchee and Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. And we camped up there for close to a week. Mm, beautiful land. It's actually stunning. So yeah. we hiked back there quite a ways. Had a, uh, we're up on a ridge looking out over this uh, valley, Phelps Creek. So I named this Phelps Creek, even so though these are Phelps very Creek. abstract. Mm -hmm. They, for me, have that feel of that, um, that landscape. Mm -hmm. So your the pieces in the exhibit are all done either kind of memory or um, memory sometimes and sketches and invention. Yeah. But you do once in a while reference sketches or past work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very layered, rich. I guess that's a third time I've used that word, but that's how <laughs> this feels to me. And I'm sorry. What's a dark the middle one here called? It's called Lost Canyon. Oh yeah, Lost Canyon. I think there are a lot of Lost Canyons yeah. out there. Huh. Is this the way home? This is called the way home. And we have some calligraphy in here? The calligraphy is simply, um, it's a cursive uh, style calligraphy and it's from a book. I simply tore mm. apart a very old book. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the book was. I can only make out a few of these characters, mm -hmm. mostly because they're they're uh, they're cursive. Mm -hmm. Actually, I just said, you know what? This is Japanese. There's a Japanese figure. So this is Japanese. I was assuming it was Chinese, but um, that's moon. I can see moon mm -hmm. somewhere else where I saw a few numbers. Here's some numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a, this is from a Japanese book. Would you like to end with um, the mixed media? We've got a couple of mixed media pieces that are up on the wall. Or... Right. Sure, let's, let's start with this one. Okay. Um, this is also a little bit older, but it's never been shown. It's been in a portfolio for some time. But I, again, I would do calligraphy practice or just brushwork practice and then sometimes tear, tear the sheets up and reassemble them, usually random at first, and then looking for patterns. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for patterns. And I feel, see a pattern here, a pattern here, and I call this one uh, Rock Sea, Rock Sea Light. Mm. And then I went over it with gold leaf mm -hmm. 
And this gold leaf, see that line, is actually um, printed from the sides of a broken violin. Mm. All of these, I, um, I was involved in a project some time ago about uh, to make a sculpture with music, you know, the stringed instruments. And we were given all these stringed mm. instruments that couldn't be repaired. So we, I tore mine all apart into pieces and I've still got the pieces and I can print. So you can see that that's the part of the violin. Mm -hmm. And then that's another part of the violin that mm -hmm. just carries it this way. And mm -hmm. th this is the same piece there, mm -hmm. but it's the other half of it. There's there's two of each piece because you get its symmetrical form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's real golden leaf in there. Yeah. And your when you use the word printing, what you're you're talking about the very basic uh, pressing an object against the paper. That's what I mean. Yeah. And that's you're not running these through a press. This is no. like the very true basic. Well, what I did is I just kind of I just put the the gold leaf adhesive to the edge of that piece of violin uh -huh. and pressed it onto the exactly paper. Waited for it to tack up to the right degree and then put gold leaf, real gold leaf on there and brush it away. Yeah. Brush away the excess. This one here, what's that one called? I'll adjust the Moon camera. Moonrise. Moonrise. Okay, so we just moved over to the other side of this painting so Jeff could talk to us about it. This is called Moonrise and it's mixed media on paper. Right, so like uh, like the other one we just talked about, uh, this is all kinds of mixed media, anything at all, except for not oil, but gouache and collage and ink and graphite mm -hmm. and such, um, assembled together, much in the way, uh, well, similarly to the, uh, an artist that I know from from Honolulu, I don't know her. I, her I, unfortunately, I lived in Honolulu right around the time she was teaching at the university. It never occurred to me to take a class. Mm. I was young. I would love to have taken a class with her. Uh, her name is Sung Yu Ho, or also known as Betty Eki. Uh, she grew up in Beijing and ended up in Honolulu in 1949, which was a really nice time to leave China if you could. <laughs> so. Um, but she assembles her paintings out of lots of different, mostly ink works, ink on paper, and then collage together into these abstract mm. pieces. And uh, I found that I do a lot of the same thing, but I was really, um, I don't know, to some degree influenced by her work. Mm. That it looks like a moonrise to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's fascinating. I, I've always loved that you have a broad range of media that you're willing to work with and um, love to mix it up quite a bit. I do love to mix it up quite yeah. a bit. And I a, a broad range of influences too. Yeah. And I'm always, always changing. I keep learning. Yeah. Wow, this is fascinating. And it's put together your work uh, for this exhibit just how hangs together beautifully. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have it here. Um, and we're up through the end of the month, so that would be um, till November 1st or October 31st. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. This is a real joy to have in the gallery. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm really happy with it. Good. Bye-bye.